Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, as Tony said, I'm Patrick Leahy. I'm the president here at Monmouth University. And on behalf of our faculty and our staff and our superstar current students, I want to welcome all of you here to our beautiful campus. I am delighted to have you in the Great Hall. However, on a day like today, I should have you out on the Great Lawn <laughs> for this event. So don't even think about how beautiful a day it is. <laughs> we are focused on important work here uh, this afternoon, and I uh, welcome all of you. I just want to say a couple uh, special welcomes before I turn the program back to, to Tony. And the first is, of course, I want to uh, welcome in a special way back to Monmouth University, the seventh president of our fine institution, Admiral Paul Gaffney, who joins us. How fitting that Paul should be here because it was he who founded the Urban Coast Institute. And I added last night that he founded the Polling Institute and he built the Multipurpose Activity Center and he built the Doherty House. And I was joking, Paul, stop me at any time. And he just let me go on and on. Uh, seriously, Paul, uh, your shadow casts a very long and a very positive shadow here at this university. And uh, I thank you so much for everything you've done to make uh, the institution that we have today. I thank you. <laughs> Quick shout out too to the current vice chair of our board of trustees, Leslie Hitchner, who joins us. Leslie has been a huge advocate of the Urban Coast Institute since its founding. And it is thanks to her and to her generosity that we have endowed this program to ensure that it can happen year after year after year. So join me in thanking Leslie for her support. I want to thank, as a group, all of the panelists. They'll all get introduced um, more formally in just a minute. I just thank you in advance on behalf of this university for your advocacy of the oceans. And we look forward to hearing what you have to say. And to lead that discussion, I'm so pleased to have today a dear friend of so many of us, the incomparable Jack Ford. I think you know Jack to be an award-winning journalist. He is a best-selling author. He was a feared trial attorney. I have it on good information that he's a heck of a teacher in his trials of the century class. But I like to refer to him as Dr. Ford, because last year around this time, it was my great pleasure to give an honorary doctorate to Jack Ford for his distinguished life of service to his community and to his country. So I welcome you, Jack, as always, to Mama. <clears throat> and I'll just say this, I, you know, this institution of ours, Monmouth, was founded 90 years ago this year as a junior college. And in those 90 years, we've continued to develop so that the next time the Carnegie classifications, which is a, that group that categorizes American higher education institutions, when it is next released, that junior college will have evolved into a national doctoral university. And along that time, we've had to pick our spots and pick them carefully, because we are a medium-sized institution. One of the spots that we have picked is the study of climate, global climate change and the changes in the oceans and the way that affects our coastlines. The Urban Coast Institute is the greatest manif manifestation of that for a couple reasons. One, we take full advantage of our unique location here at the Jersey Shore. And two, this is one of the great issues of our time. Maybe one of the great issues of all time. And for Monmouth to play its small part in that is really satisfying to all the members of this community. So it is uh, with great pride that I welcome all of you 
to the 16th annual uh, Oceans Future Sympo Symposium here at Monmouth. Thank you and welcome. I just want to make sure that the uh, director of this Urban Coast Institute gives a proper introduction. It is n not an overstatement to say that there's no way that the Urban Coast Institute would be the institute that it is today without the extraordinary leadership of Tony McDonald. I think, Paul, you would agree. And so I'd ask you to join me in welcoming Tony McDonald. <laughs> th th thanks, Pat. And I, I will say, um, you know, uh, talking about standing in the shadow, um, any time after I come after Pat, I remember that I should stand on my tiptoes so that I look a little bit taller. But thank you very much uh, for your generosity. And I guess I would like to make one general statement, just personal, that uh, in addition to his other accomplishments, Admiral Gaffney has been a fantastic mentor for me. So I really want to thank you for that, because that's extraordinary. That's, and that's what we do at Monmouth every day with our students and really thinking about how we model behaviors for the future. And I really think that's why this issue is so very important, because all the students I went into care about this issue. They know they want to make a difference. They know that their kids need to care about this. So it's an issue that's not front and center only for the science that we do, but front and center for our communities and the people that we work with. So that's why I'm so excited about this panel today. I have the kind of task, generally, that we have to do really to thank our sponsors uh, for this event. Um, so I do, they're listed in your program, but really recognize the diversity of groups that have come together to sponsor this event, not only support for UCI, but the broad recognition of business, environmental groups, um, uh, uh, partners with UCI scientists that have supported this event because it's so important. So I won't list them all or mention them all, but I do want to thank our silver event sponsor, Orsted, the Ocean Champion Awards sponsors, Nigerian Associates, and Pringle, Quinn, and Enzano, and our gold program sponsors, Atlantic Shores, uh, the Nature Conservancy, the natural, New Jersey Natural Gas, the Ocean Foundation, and PSE&G. So thanks to them and to all the program sponsors that are listed. It's really, we could not do this, and this money supports our students. We directly support research opportunities for our students with the funds that we raise for these events. So really making a difference today by being here. So thank you uh, very much. So it is my privilege to sort of turn it over to the real experts. Um, and that's my skill set. I really hang out with smarter people than me and bring smarter people to Monmouth University. And these are some of the smartest people that I know and most generous people that I know. So thank you, Jack, for agreeing to lead this um, discussion. Uh, and you've already, already been introduced to him. And so we have uh, listed here, and we'll have more information about them in your programs. We're very environmentally um, sensitive. You can just use your QR codes, and you can get more detailed bios. But um, immediately to the left of Jack is uh, Dr. Rich, Rich Spinrad, he's the NOAA um, uh, administrator, um, and thank you very much for coming, Rick. Thank, thank you very much. Next to him is Dr. Margaret Leinen. She is uh, the, the director of the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Thank you very much, Margaret. Next to her is Dr. Tashiana Osborne. Thank you, Tashiana, for joining us today. She's a climate change uh, advisor for the U.S. Agency for International Development through the AAAS um, Science and Technology Polo Fe Policy Fellowship. Thank you, Dr. Osborne. Next to her is Charlotte Hudson, and Charlotte is the LENFET Ocean Program um, Director. And finally, but certainly not least, um, from joining us from Cape Cod, is uh, Dr. Rick Murray, and he's the VP for Science and Engineering at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, um, uh, uh, and also an incredible guest. So you can see we're bringing some of the leading experts on our topic today, which is really catalyzing innovation and action for oceans and climate. So with that, we'll get that turn it right over to Jack. Thank you very much. Tony, thank you very much. I'm not sure if this is working or not, so I'm just gonna, it doesn't appear to be, so I'm just gonna talk loud for uh, I wanna welcome you also um, on behalf of the Institute and also want to extend our thanks once again to our, our guests here today. You know, it, it's very rare that you can get a constellation of such accomplished individuals, such accomplished science, scientists, who bring not only their knowledge, but perhaps more important for our purposes, they bring their passion to what they do every day, and we thank them for that. So when Tony asked me about this, and he said, all right, we're, we're going to have a, this array, 
as I said, a constellation of extraordinary people here. Um, how do we do this? And the thought was that our audience here is composed of, there might be a few scientists here, but essentially we have students, we have um, members of the public, we have members of the university community. So the thought was to, to let's try to get a better understanding. Let's take advantage of the presence of these illustrious personages here. And let's see if at the end of this session, we can walk away with a better understanding. Better understanding of, of what the problems are, better understanding of what some possible solutions could be, and a better understanding of where we might go from here, to get from here to there. You know, it, it's, it, we live in an extraordinary place. The ocean for us, you know, many of you like me, I grew up here, you know, came back here after college and law school because this is the place I wanted to be. And, and for me, I recognize the ocean is not just part of our landscape. Thank you. Perfect. Ocean is not just part of our landscape. It's, it's an essential part of our being. And not just our physical being, which is, which is critical, but also for many of us, it's an essential part of our spiritual being. So the idea of confronting that which has been, been so important to us in our lives and will be so important to generations after us makes this such a meaningful session. So again, I want to thank you all for, for joining us here so that you can help us better understand this. I often say this, and I think I said it to you before, in these types of sessions, at the end, when you walk out of here, we can say, I think I've got it now. I, I've got a better understanding of all this, and I know where should we, be, we should be going and how we should get there. Um, that's, a, that's a pretty big ask of all of you. <laughs> But hopefully you'll get us closer than we are right now. So once again, our thanks to everybody. Our thanks to you for joining us. And, and let's, let's start our conversation here. So in, in looking at this and trying to better understand this, you know, I was struck by, by something. And maybe we can use this to sort of frame our conversation. I was struck by what, as a layperson, seems to be a bit of a conundrum. And that is, we are told that our oceans are being impacted by climate change, on one hand. And then on the other hand, we are told, but our oceans can help to resolve the problems that accompany climate change. And your first thought might be, how can that coexist, those two thoughts and those two ideas? And so we thought, well, you can help us to understand that. So let's start off, if we can. And Margaret, I'm going to come to you first, if I could. Let's start off with a, a, to, to talk about the damage that's being done to our oceans by climate change. What do we need to know about that? Do we each have one? Let's take that one. OK. Great, thank you. Um, that's a really big question. And I'm going to give just a bit of the answer. And there are probably a lot of people in this audience who could give much more of it. But I'll just hit some high points. So climate change, most of us think about it in terms of warming. And that has a huge influence on the, the ocean. And I heard from President Gaffney, Admiral Gaffney, that we're about 1,500 yards from the ocean here. So. Uh, sea level rise is a big impact because when you warm water, it takes up more space. So half of the sea level rise is just coming from the warming of the ocean. And the entire ocean is warming, not just the surface. The surface is warming more, but the entire ocean is warming. So sea level rise. A second big impact is the impact that that warming has on ecosystems. And part of that, so for organisms that can move around, uh, it affects uh, their, the water that they're in, and many of them change where they move around, fisheries. So fisheries tend to move from toward the poles, uh, and, uh, uh, chain, and so a fishery that used to be very uh, important for one state might find that the fish were no longer as prevalent there, another state is benefiting. So movement, and then 
uh, for those organisms that can't move, uh, it can change the environment so much that they can no longer be there. So sea level rise, uh, ecosystem impacts. Uh, a third piece is that warming the ocean also changes the circulation of the ocean, where the currents are and how strong the currents are. So those are just a, a couple of, of uh, pieces that come from warming. And I'll just mention one other that a lot of people have heard about. And this is an indirect effect, not of, the war of climate itself, but of the emissions that we're putting in the atmosphere that cause that warming. And that is the acidification of the ocean. So more CO2 going into the ocean causes the ocean to become a little bit more acid, just as the CO2 that is in your bottle of carbonated beverage makes it a little bit acidic. And that in turn, just that, that small difference is enough to make it very difficult for some organisms that make skeletal material out of, of chalk-like material, makes it a little difficult for them to make that. And so it has impacts on, on that. So there's lots more, but that's, that's a start. Let me ask you, hold on to the mic. I, I won't talk. So, so we, we hear, and I, maybe this is not too strong a term, we hear that our oceans are in some ways under siege here. And yet, as I said before, we also hear that the, the oceans can provide, at least in some way, shape, um, a, a basis for us to attack climate change. So what can the oceans do, ideally, to fight that? So the way that oceans can help us fight back is that they can help take up that CO2. So yes, acidification is an issue, but eventually the, the, the ocean exchanges carbon with the atmosphere. And one of the most abundant components of the ocean is the chemistry, uh, the, the, the ion bicarbonate. So think about it as a giant glass of Alka-Seltzer. And, uh, and it's the same ion. Yes. Yeah. I can't take credit. Somebody over here. <laughs> so the the atmosphere is trying to equilibrate with that giant container of of Alka Seltzer, and eventually, if if we stopped putting CO two into the atmosphere, the excess that's in the atmosphere would exchange with the ocean, and it will, would all end up there. That's where it's going to end up. So. If we could make that happen faster, then the oceans could help us take it up. And there are lots of ideas about that. Some of those ideas have to do with, uh, with plants that, that take up CO2 and enhancing the ability of plants in the ocean to do that. Some of the ideas have to do with uh, technological fixes. We call it climate intervention and uh, uh, actively removing carbon dioxide and putting it in the ocean. So those are a couple ways. But the important thing to, to remember is that if we stopped putting so much CO2 into the atmosphere, it's going to wind up in the ocean. That's where most of the carbon is in the, the system. Let me assist. One of the things you were all asked to think about some of, again, some of these solutions, specifically, how do we ensure that the ocean ecosystems are healthy, um, that they're resilient, they're productive, while at the same time making sure that we can support sustainable ocean economic policy. And, and Rick, let me come to you, because I, I saw you can grab the mic. I, and I want to ask you about a, a term I saw, and it, it referred to the new blue economy. Tell us about that. Oh, man. Uh, so we got about three hours, right? 
<laughs> yeah, thank you for that question, Jack. I appreciate it. Um, so the way to think about this is, I think everybody in the room would be familiar with one aspect of the blue economy. Uh, you see it off the coast here in terms of commercial shipping. Uh, the ferries that run are part of a blue economy. Oil and gas, fisheries, those have strong economic signals associated with them. And these have thrived for millennia. Uh, and they were not terribly dependent on a deep knowledge of the ocean. Sometimes there was a little bit better knowledge, sometimes not so much. And what we've realized is that if we get better understanding of the ocean, there's actually an economic benefit. Now, the US Navy recognized this many, many years ago with something that they call optimal, ship, optimal track ship routing, which is basically ta taking the knowledge of the ocean and using that to get the fleet where it needs to go more efficiently, faster. Commercial shippers now realize we could do the same thing, especially if you see, for example, the Arctic open up for commercial shipping. So the question is, can we understand enough about the ocean and collect enough information that we can actually predict how it will respond? The currents, the tides, the waves, the things that live in the ocean in a way that people can make money out of that in a sustainable fashion. So I'll give you a very specific example. I love this story because it was in a previous job I had at NOAA. I was the head of the National Ocean Service. And we decided, this is about 20 years ago, we decided we were going to take the data that we were collecting at NOAA and get this, a new bold move. We were going to put it out on the web. <laughs> now, this was 20 years ago, so it was a new concept, right? The and World Wide Web. The World Wide Web, exactly. Um, and I get a phone call from a guy in Florida, and he says, I'm going to sue you. I said, really? People like to sue the federal government. They really like to sue NOAA. I said, why are you going to sue us? And he said, because I have a business where I take data and I provide it to people on a subscription basis. I said, wait, let me make sure I understand this. So you're taking data that were collected on the public nickel already and charging people for it again? He said, well, yeah, I guess you could see it that way. I said, sue away. I said, you don't have a business case. But now if you did something proprietary with the data, then you do have a business case. And to his credit, it's a guy named Mitch Roffer, to his credit, he said, I think there's a market. And that market, it turned out, was the uh, recreational tournament sport fishing industry, a well-controlled, sustainable industry. And he said, I think I can build my own model, proprietary, right, intellectual property, and I can provide those sport fishermen, the information that will help them catch the biggest, whatever it was, marlin, tarpon, sailfish. That guy has a thriving business now. That, to me, is a business that was made out of knowledge, only knowledge. So he monetized understanding of the ocean. That, to me, is the new blue economy. Let me ask, um, and, and I'll ask you to all jump in. Tashiana, I'll, I'll come to you first. And I suspect one of, of the problems Look, we, we talk in, in every business, in every industry, about the notion of perceptions versus reality. And we're always concerned when the perception might become a reality and not, not legitimately. And so I listen to this, the new blue economy, and I, I guess what I can get concerned with is if people don't understand this, if they're not here and they're going to walk out afterwards and say, I do understand this now, but if they don't, do you suspect that, that there is, there's a tension between, and maybe even conflict in the minds of people, between the notion of, okay, how do we protect our oceans? Um, how do we help them to help us? And yet, how can people who have made their livings through the oceans over the years, how can they still continue to be productive? Or is one going to suffer because of the other? How, how, what's the answer to that, and how should we be answering that, do you think? Yeah, that's a... It's a big question. Um, <clears throat> I think a lot of conversations have to happen and continue to happen where the communities that are most affected are part of the conversation. So those that are dependent on fishing um, for their income, their main in stream of income, um, being part of the conversation and bringing together key players in that conversation to develop 
opportunities where they can, you know, really make a sustainable uh, life choice longer term in fishing and where those options exist, where trainings might exist, um, and opportunities to train trainers. So that continues throughout the community. Um, and it's not, it's something that the communities can really take grasp of and, and move forward. So. Yes, you would like to, to jump in also your thoughts on what we've talked about so far. Sure. I think the, I, I, Margaret actually alluded to something earlier, which uh, was an experience I had very, uh, probably about 10 years ago in my career where I had the opportunity to be in front of a group of fishermen, which is a wonderful opportunity unless you are going to tell them something they don't necessarily want to hear. <laughs> So I had steeled myself. I, I'm from uh, the great state of North Carolina, and so I was on the coast. And one of the biggest fisheries in North Carolina, which you all may also recognize, are summer flounder, which you may see um, more often now. Um, but when I was uh, with this group of individuals, we were talking a little bit about the changing oceans. And I was prepared um, to make a case for we really need to think ahead, we need to plan ahead, we need to think about where, where these species are moving, how the habitats are changing. Um, and that, in, that group of individuals looked at me and they said, you don't have to tell us that. We're on board. The fish already left. They've already, they've swam. And so I heard one of the individuals told me a story about he is, uh, for those of you who know fishing, you have to, you're, you're given a permit, but you have to land your fish, meaning you have to dock your boat with all the fish in it, in the state where your permit is issued. You're not allowed to land, if you're from North Carolina, you can't land your boat in Virginia or New Jersey or New York or anywhere else. You bring your, you catch your, your allocation of fish and you bring it to your state. And this individual said, well, you know, recently I have been, I catch summer flounder, I steam, I drive my boat all the way up the coast of, to off of the coast of New Jersey and New York and I catch my summer flounder. And then I turn around and I steam all the way back to North Carolina to land my fish. We clearly have a problem. Like, I'm wasting gas, I'm wasting time, I'm away from home longer. I mean, it's, it was a very clear community challenge. And it, so, what I thought, where I thought I was gonna face opposition in trying to communicate the oceans are changing, we need to think more proactively, I was getting in reverse. Why haven't you helped with this already? Right? Why, you, you all are supposed to be the scientists. You all are supposed to help us <laughs> with this ahead of time. I, I really would like, we, we need some answers. We need to figure this out. Now, in no way should I suggest that they wanted to give away their allocation of fish. That was not the issue. It was more that, but I will say that the blue economy is not in dichotomy necessarily with conservation and sustainability. A lot of those things are going hand in hand in ways that we may not have necessarily expected. Rick, your, your thoughts on this before we move to some other, some other areas. Yes, thank you. I think another tension and perception about that tension um, a, as a driver comes from a lack of sort of community respect between different constituencies, and I mean sort of nationally, in that often maybe quote unquote inland people might not understand exactly the stresses and the pressures on the coastal people or the coastal contributors to the blue economy. And part of that is because the ocean is out of sight and out of mind from many, many, many people. As a once practicing ocean scientist, I was somewhat jealous of the astronomers because everybody in this country can walk around and look up at night and see the stars and say, that's pretty cool. Whereas only those of us that live on the coast look out there and might wonder why. But even that's not enough because most of what's going on in the ocean is underneath the ocean and you can't even see that. So I think one of the drivers from, from my observation is, could be mediated, could be mitigated by a little more sensitivity and understanding and, and willingness of people to talk to the fisher, fishers. What's going on? What are your issues in terms of steaming up and down the coast? Is that one example? Or, or any of the other um, uh, challenges facing people who work on, and live on the ocean. Another example here, I'm, I'm sure, is of um, coastal zoning. 
you know, it's, it's one thing to sit in an office building and, and come up with some, you know, great ideas to preserve uh, coastal infrastructure and private, private residences and homes and so on, but it's another thing when it's someone's, you know, inherited equity and they're, you know, going to be depending on that. So I really think there can be much more conversation and communication and social respect between the different constituencies to help ease that perception of tension. Let me, we've talked a bit, a bit about some problems. Let's talk about you now some possible approaches that can be taken. Um, I saw, and I had seen this when it came out, that the, the UN has declared 2020 to 2030 to be the ocean decade. And the title is The Science We Need for the Ocean We Want. So, um, Charlotte, I'll ask you first, and then Tashiana, I want you to jump in. The ocean decade, we've had ocean decades before. Haven't we declared in the past ocean decades? I think there's several currently ongoing, yes. Yeah. <laughs> what, what does that not say ocean to decades. us? It's not ocean decades, just, right. yes. But, so, as members of the public, and we hear this and we say, well, this sounds familiar, and yet we're still 1,500 yards from here, as Admiral said. Just so that you know, by the way, that was the distance that Admiral Gaffney ran when he was on the track team at the Naval Academy. Just so, <laughs> just so you know. He still thinks in terms of that. Right. So I guess the question is, what do you say to people who say, We've done, we did this before, right? What's different about this one? Absolutely. This, this is my favorite question, which Margaret, unfortunately, because Margaret is the co-chair, I should point out, of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development of the advisory body. I have the pleasure of serving with her, but I will answer this question from my perspective, and then I know she has more to add to this as well. Um, the reason, and, and I should just say, my background is, is very early, a very early career in marine ecology, but for a long time, I have been in philanthropy. So my job is actually to give away money for ocean science. That is my... <laughs> there are a lot of folks that want to talk to you before when you leave. I, and I don't have any business cards. I left them all at home. Um, but the, the, the specific reason that this ocean decade, I think, is going to make a difference is uh, the United Nations, uh, the uh, UNESCO, and the organizers of this particular decade decided that the science we need for the ocean we want was a lot about what is the science we need and how are we going to get it. So it wasn't business as usual. They actually decided, and if you go on the UN, if you go on the website, which is oceandecade.org, you will see terms that may be somewhat unfamiliar to people in this room or other scientists, which are called co-design, co-production. What that means is the questions that we need to be asking about the oceans and the science that we need needs to be discovered in new ways. We need to engage with communities. We need to engage with stakeholders. We need to ask the people on the ground, what challenges are you having? Talking about the communities and, and opening up conversations and then work in dialogue to say, well, you know, we have research questions that can answer that. We have methods. We have, we have a whole team of oceanographers who can answer these questions with the data we've collected. But it's really helpful to learn from them what their needs are. And so I think the difference with this decade is that it is much more focused on what are the needs on the ground, not just what do the scientists want to tell us. Tashiana, you're, you're nodding. You take it yeah. then to Margaret, if you would. Yeah, I'm absolutely on the co-design bandwagon as well. <laughs> co-design um, through each stage of the process of developing activities, projects, thinking about science that helps um, inform policies, decisions, all of that is going to be really important moving forward. So in the work that I'm doing now, we do a lot on um, thinking about capacity development in under-resourced nations, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. And with the UN decade, Ocean Decade, there's a lot of that focus as well, thinking about um, building capacity in a way that is forward moving and, and kind of a more modern approach of making sure the community members are in the room, they're part of the process and really helping move things forward and that the approaches to solve problems end up 
not doing harm that's unintended. So thinking about this do no harm strategy ahead of time. What are potential harms that could result? Uh, and the last thing is just making sure that then those decisions are not being made somewhere else, like say in DC, that um, there, there are decisions being made there, but that they're informed by what's needed on the ground. Margaret, jump in. Everybody's been pointing to you here, so <laughs> you get the mic. Well, a, a couple things. Some of those other decades that you talked about, uh, when I was a graduate student, it was the International Decade of Ocean Exploration. And so it was, we don't know enough about this to really characterize the ocean and understand it. So it was, let's go out and find out about the ocean. This is not the UN Decade of Ocean Science. It's the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So is, is that progress? That is, because that says we now know enough about the ocean and have the capacity to design new work that is going to help us solve problems. This existential problem that, uh, that you mentioned, I think the president said maybe it's the problem, the ultimate problem, sustainable development. And that is a complete evolution of what's happened. And Charlotte talked about co-design, um, capacity development, and we sit on a board that has rejected programs for the decade because they did not involve capacity development or co-design. So it's serious. Just explain, when we say co-design, just explain the concept. What are we talking about? Get the users who are going to need this information together with the scientists to so the scientists are pointed at the right information that's so scientists necessary. are not saying, you down there, we're telling you what you need right. and how you get there. Exactly. You tell us what you need and we'll help you get there? Exactly. Yeah. Rick, um, I, I, we talked about the title, The Science We Need for the Ocean We Want. And I, I would suspect as a non-scientist, in order to figure out the science we need, you gotta figure out the ocean we want. Right? Answer the back question and then get to the beginning. Do Is there sort of unanimity when we're talking about here's the ocean we want, so now let's go get it? Absolutely. What's your next question? <laughs> um, I, I think... I'm a, I gotta tell, I'm a lawyer. That sounds like a lawyer's answer, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, I would... I would point out, and, and I'm really glad that Margaret called out the sustainability aspect, because all, all too often that element is lost in the dialogue. And sustainability is a broad term as well. I like to think in terms of sustainability as it applies to the risks that we are facing. And so you can think in terms of food security. You can think in terms of energy security. You can think in terms of national security, other forms of security. and so. The ocean that we want, I think, is one that is sustainable in all the traditional definitions, but also is helping us to address these risks. So think about food security as an example. And sustainability is really a good discussion topic around food security because part of the answer for food security is undoubtedly aquaculture. Our ability to grow protein, but to do it, we've got to make sure we're doing it sustainably in a way that we're not inadvertently causing damage to the ecosystem or changing the dynamics of the ocean one way or another. So I do think the ocean that we want to get to is one that is sustainable in terms of being able to prosper and benefit in the face of these risks that I just alluded to. Natural hazards is another one, of course, as well. And so sea level rise, as an example, more extreme tropical cyclones as another example. How do we mitigate against that in a sustainable fashion? So I think that's how we define the ocean that we want to get to. Let me jump to another thing here, and that is the, the administration recently released its Ocean Climate Action Plan. So let me ask you, and I'm going to let somebody jump in whoever wants to. What, what are the, 
again, from our perspective, non-scientists, but to understand this, what would you point to as, as some of the most important recommendations that are coming from the administration plan? Who wants to jump with this? Well, as part of the administration, I'd be happy to take a first <laughs> shot at it. And, and as a co-author of one of a cast of thousands, um, I actually believe the uh, Ocean Climate Action Plan is a really good testimony to the federal government getting together to try to put some of the best ideas together. And there are hundreds and hundreds of recommendations and ideas in there. I will tell you the thing that I think is probably one of the most substantive recommendations and represents a fundamental change in our thinking. And that is nature-based solutions. That is, uh, there's a tendency. Again, meaning what? I'm going to get to that in terms, of, and I'll, I'll try to put it in the context of Superstorm Sandy and everything you've faced here in New Jersey, where Obviously, we want to try to harden the coasts, if you will. We want to become more resilient to the next Superstorm Sandy. And we could build a lot of gray infrastructure. We could go out there and put jetties and groins and move tons and tons of sand. And I think most of you know that's a temporary solution in most cases. And it's not always, always an environmentally sustainable solution. So can we effectively look to Mother Nature? One of the most creative solutions that came right out of Superstorm Sandy was a, a team that said, let's get involved in oyster texture. Mm -hmm. They said, let's build oyster beds around the city, around New York, to try to mitigate against the storm surge of the next. That is a nature-based solution. But you can't just simply say, hey, let's plant marsh grass or put oyster beds. You want to make sure you're doing it again in an environmentally sustainable manner. You would never want to put an invasive species of oysters into an oyster texture solution. So that is embedded. It's one of the main elements of the Ocean Climate Action Plan, and it's one that I feel most proud of for the administration, because it does represent a fundamentally different kind of thinking. Are there any things, I'll ask the, the balance of our group here, um, with all appropriate deference to Rick, are there any things that are missing, do you think? from that thing. <laughs> it's like, remember musical chairs that we would play? Musical mic. Whoever ends up with the mic when I end my question is the one who's going to ask, answer. So the question specifically on what's missing. Or, uh, or is there an approach be, or something sure. that you'd like to, that you think could, could enhance the program? Yeah, a number of us were talking about this earlier today, and although the workforce is mentioned at several key locations throughout as sort of part of the fabric of the, of the plan, um, my personal opinion is that we, uh, again, as a society, need to do a better job of integrating um, ocean-based uh, workforce at all different levels. And I'm, I'm meaning, uh, technical support for the wind turbines, um, uh, electronic development for navigation on fish boats, but I'm also speaking of higher level um, thought processes on bringing uh, applied mathematicians into the field to help us do a better job of modeling uh, storm surges and storm impacts and bringing in other fields, not just local knowledge, but other allied intellectual knowledge from outside the fields of ocean sciences or climate sciences to help us understand um, uh, not only the, the world that we're seeing changing before our eyes, but help us develop some of the solutions. So I would have preferred or, or like to see, and it is a long document, so maybe there is a few pages that I may have inadvertently missed, but um, I really do think that we're talking fundamentally about people. We care about climate change for the planet, but also because of the impact on us. And the previous question, you know, sustainable development. Because people matter, and we're all here. And I think we need to pay that, pay that much more attention to the people that are going to be the ones solving these problems, and how we integrate um, their education throughout the whole spectrum. Not thinking it's so much of just a, you know, this targeted constituency or that targeted constituency, but all throughout. Um, you know, we need more lawyers who understand um, what's going Has on. Has ever heard anybody say we need exactly more lawyers? Right. 
Yeah. Now, there was more to that near, sentence. We took it out of context. Of it's getting near the end of the week. But, you know, doctors, I mean, the whole, we need to get the whole society involved in this climate situation, all of society. Let me ask you, while well, you have the mic here, and, and again, um, VP of Research Engineering at Woods Hole. So clearly, we need to focus on, on technology development, innovation. Uh, is that, maybe the best way to ask it, is that keeping pace with the degree of our problems? The history of science has a lot of stories where science is driving the development of technology and other stories where technology is uh, creating opportunity for people to ask questions that they were not able to ask before. <laughs> and I mean, Galileo, right, with the telescope, because he presumably wanted to look at the Mars canals, and so he was, you know, inventing the telescope, I guess. People invented watches because they were tired of carrying clocks around all the way. You know, whatever. So um, I think I think today uh, we're probably in a more technologically driven world where technology is allowing us to ask and answer questions that some of us, some of the scientific communities, have actually had for a long time. I mean, we've been asking some questions about ocean acidification for 20 years, 30 years. We've been asking questions about fishing for, you know, 100 years. In fact, if you go back and look at the, um, some history of fishing in Maine, a professor Jeff Bolster at University of New Hampshire published this really interesting book where he was noting that uh, in the early 1900s, it was the fishermen who were really asking the politicians to limit uh, fishing because the the fishermen were worried about fish running out and the scientists were saying oh no there's plenty of fish out there man keep going so these these conversations and these populations will, will change and so today I think we're in this technology is driving or technology is allowing us to answer a lot of questions so yes and back to the blue economy I mean these are high-tech jobs these are high-tech um, industries, uh, they're translatable, they're translatable from other industries. Um, you, you look at what we all have in our, you know, back pocket with, with uh, cell phones and everything, data processing, all this, we're, we're in a technology driven world right now, I would say. Tashiana, you, you are working technology, innovation, your thoughts on where we are. I just kind of want to hone in on that point about working across sectors. So when I'm working with teams in Nigeria, for instance, I'm meeting with different technical teams on climate change and oceans. So that includes health teams, democracy and governance. You know, there's matters of, of conflict that can arise with uh, decreasing resources. Uh, meeting with education teams when there's increased flooding problems or uh, problems with food security. Um, the kids can't get to school maybe because of the floods and then how do you teach hungry kids? You know, they're not getting adequate food. So that can be something also applied within the US of thinking about working across these sector teams and where there are options, even training or encouraging action in terms of being ocean advocates, ocean champions, climate champions from a very early age, um, and then building those careers that people can go to once they're at that stage. So careers in the ocean technology and science and really having that applied within, within their community. Let me, uh, Charlotte, let me ask you this, if I can. And, and the idea of how the ocean research academic community can work better, all right, with, um, as you said, you know, philanthropic groups, um, those who are, um, who are in a position to do things to help, is, and or, often you hear somebody saying, well, it's, it's, they're not paying attention to me, or we're not paying attention to them. So how does that happen to aid in this, this whole conversation we're having now? Great question. I, 
I'm sure it would surprise no one in this room to think that when you are the one with the money, people tend to listen or answer the phone when you call. <laughs> so I will just start by saying they're, they're, this idea of scientists, whether we call it engaged science, actionable science, working with communities to understand their needs, it n wasn't necessarily what scientists were trained to do. It wasn't what I was trained to do. Um, and so having that uh, question posed to researchers when they would come to us and say, when they come to the philanthropic community, they say, I have a great idea, I know what needs to be done, we need to run this model, we need to do this research, and this is what's going then we'll solve the problem. And I think it is up to the philanthropic community, as it is up to all engaged citizens, to say, well, why do you think that's going to make a difference? It's, it's, it's actually using the scientific method to question the scientific research that's being proposed, in the sense that understanding where that information, where the information is needed on the ground is as much a part of the battle that the philanthropic community needs to own as it is paying out the money to do the research. I think everybody needs to take ownership of, or those with purse strings, and I should say, in the scale of philanthropic communities, the federal government has a whole lot more, and, and so do many other philanthropies than we do, but I... I really don't have that much money, that was quite... <laughs> but, I, but I will say, I think the, it is up to the philanthropic community to help provide resources where they can to both communities and researchers to work together. And I think then they also have to be leaders with, other, with industry. I mean, there are lots, there are, there are many individuals and, and many re resources coming into this community from many different sources, and I think it's that collaboration is where we're going to see the greatest growth. Rick, you, and then Rick, you. Yeah, if I just want to add a point that I see over the last 10 years, 15 years or so, much more of a partnering attitude between scientists and philanthropists. And I, um, you know, in working with a lot of my scientists and other scientists around the country, I'm working with them. I mean, you spoke about how you're working with philanthropists and their attitude. I'm trying to teach our scientists to not treat philanthropists as just walking ATM machines. They are, you know, dedicated, philanthropists are dedicated people. They've either made the money themselves or they've inherited the money, or they're working with close colleagues. They have an intimate tie to that money, and they're into this for a reason. And it's not appropriate, and it's counterproductive for scientists to just sort of think, oh yeah, I can just give them my ideas, and if they don't like the idea, that's on them. They, they, if they were smarter, they would get it. And so I see scientists working more closely, and the, the more the, the scientists who are most, most successful in the philanthropic world are those that really partner with them and want to learn what's going on, just like they do with the feds when they're writing proposals to the federal government. They, they research and they want to know what the feds are trying to fund. We need to do that with the philanthropists, and those that do are the most successful relationships. Rick, you want to I, I can say that. Uh, so I just want to put a, a really fine point on what both Charlotte and Rick said, and make sure folks in the audience understand that the pressure on the system. So I, my agency gets an appropriation of $7 billion a year. If I look at the requirements for what we meet, need to do, we could easily spend twice that, easily. We just got through the bipartisan inf uh, infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act, an additional $6.3 billion. We've already put uh, announcements of funding opportunity out on the street. The pressure, the proposal pressure is running anywhere from 6 to 1 to 13 to 1, which gives you some sense that no matter how much philanthropy is there, no matter how much I or I saw Tom Drake from the Navy in here and others and, and Margaret and Rick worked at NSF, no matter how much the federal government and philanthropy puts to this, we're still leaving a lot of really good ideas on the, on, the, on, the, on the floor. And that's an important thing for people to realize because there is so much capacity out there that goes unfulfilled. Let me ask a similar question, and Margaret, I'll ask you first. Um, 
So when, when we look at this, one of the things we realize is that, that the looking for answers, it's not simply um, natural science and oceanography problems, right? We look at social science, we look at uh, communication and, and media, we look at government, we look at policy. And it, it seems, again, from a layperson's perspective, that they all have to be incorporated into solutions. So, Margaret, here's an easy question for you. How do we do that? I think that the key is that people in this room understand, but people in most rooms don't understand that it's not optional to know about the ocean. It's not optional. The ocean is controlling our climate. Two billion people on the planet depend on seafood from the ocean as their primary protein. Global trade is marine trade. 95% of the stuff that you get was transported to this country uh, by, by ships. Our national security is absolutely one that depends on the ocean. So we've talked about We've talked about climate, we've talked about food, we've talked about security, we've talked about the economy. It is not optional, but most people think it is. It's a nice to have to know something about the ocean. They wouldn't think that about, agri about agriculture. Everybody knows that that is essential for us. And I think that one of the things that we have to convey is that it's not optional. And we need everybody in that, just as for agriculture, you know, you have people in transportation, you have people in the chemistry of, of uh, uh, fertilizer, you have people in legal framing, you, you know, it's, it's an ecosystem. And we need that because it's not optional not to have it. Let me ask one more question. A couple of you can jump in here, and then we're going to open up the, the session to some questions from folks out on the floor. There are mics set up on either side here, I believe, or at least there's one mic over there. Um, so let me ask one question, and then if you have some thoughts, some, que some genuine questions rather than statements, <laughs> if, I could, if I could ask you to do that. I've, I've been the journalism, television journalism for 35 years, and, and I, we've often said, it's a great expression, somebody once said the most dangerous place to be in the U.S. is on the San Andreas Fault. And I've said often, no, the most dangerous place is between somebody who really wants to make a statement and a microphone. <laughs> so here, let's just keep in mind we're looking for questions to help us understand here in the session. So, so Margaret, your comment about it's not optional leads me to this question. I'll ask whoever wants to jump in. How then do we communicate that? to the public that this is not indeed optional and that we need, even if you've never seen an ocean, we need people to grasp the idea that there are certain things that we need to do, not optional. How do we communicate that to the public? Who wants to take this first? Tasha. I'll, I'll add a piece to that answer. Um, it is thinking about the local effects in some cases. So how what's happening somewhere else in the ocean is affecting that local community, say, further inland. So for my research, for instance, during my PhD, I studied these storms that are called atmospheric rivers, and they increase in terms of their occurrence and their, or rather, frequency and their intensity in a changing climate. And storms like that and others are increasing as a result of the interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere. So the, what happens in the ocean is really important for those storms and the people inland that are affected by them. So finding ways to communicate that local effect and then also the co-benefits of taking action on climate and what's happen happening in the ocean. So maybe thinking about uh, different job prospects that can lead to more sustainability long term and build up the economy. That's one route, but there are many others. Charlotte, how about you? 
I'm glad I'm not going last because I'm not sure this answer is going to be as helpful because I was think as as she, um, we were think as you were speaking I was thinking about am I going to answer this question truthfully and I think the <laughs> I am <laughs> which is That's I an don't interesting interesting preface for an answer well, <laughs> <laughs> Your Honor I'm not sure I'm going to answer this live, question we're not live so it's fine not. <laughs> my my point being, I don't think we know the answer. Because if we knew how to communicate that the ocean was essential and caring for the ocean was not optional, we'd be doing it. Because it would be obvious to everybody. And we haven't. We are not there. And so sadly, I think every year, more bad things happen. And that, at you, I mean, I was, I was, I shouldn't be chuckling, but I was reacting when you said atmospheric rivers, because what did we watch on the news for the past however many weeks in happening in California with the rain? And every my parents, who don't follow what I do particularly <laughs> with detail, they're very proud of me, but they're not as tuned in. They're saying, what is an atmospheric river? I mean, and so it's, it, that is what is getting the attention. It's Superstorm Sandy, it's atmospheric rivers, it's the wildfires. I just relocated my family from Washington DC to North Carolina, and I cannot tell you how many other people have relocated to North Carolina from California in the past year because of wildfires, right? Not an ocean issue, but a climate issue. And this, so it, I'm, I'm sad to say that I don't think we have, we don't know how we have not done a good job, and we don't have our finger on how to make it as relevant as we need to be. Is, is part of this the answer, and Rick, I'll ask you one second, that as we've seen oftentimes in our history, and painfully, that often it takes a crisis for us to change. A crisis for us to say, oh, so that's an atmospheric river. Why haven't I ever heard of that before? Or a crisis, Hurricane Sandy, those of us who lived through it, here. So it is part of the answer to that question, sadly, that change might have to be driven, at least in part, by crisis confrontation? Fear is a motivator. Finance is a motivator. So here's the question for the audience. How many of you have any form of insurance? I, I suspect there's nobody who's not raised a hand in the room. The interesting thing a few years ago, about 20, 25 years ago, the major investor in postdocs in physical oceanography was the reinsurance industry. Because they realized that their way of mitigating risk was effectively to just distribute their investments in the Philippines, in Africa, and it was the physical oceanographic community who said, you know, you actually may be compounding your risk because what we as scientists call teleconnections, what happens in the Western Pacific might affect Africa. El Nino is a global pheno phenomenon. And so I think part of this is getting out of our comfort zone um, and recognizing the financial impacts as well as the fear of major catastrophe. But all aspects of our lives, I would argue, are in one way or another affected by our understanding of the oceans. Real estate. We talked, I, I lived, before I came back to this job, I was living in the high desert of ocean, not exactly a coastal area, but I ended up having to effectively clear cut my property because of the drought that was being impacted by a lot of the changes in precipitation patterns. The oceanographic community provided the understanding that allowed me to make decisions about protecting my property, self-insuring, if you will. So I think real estate, reinsurance, medical, all of these, if we can connect with those communities, they affect our, our lives, our livelihoods, our lifestyles. That, in addition to the fear of motivation, I think is how we get people more to recognize exactly what Margaret alluded to, that we all need to have to care about these issues. All right, probably a good time to open up um, the session if there's some folks that have some questions here that they would like to pose. This is your, probably one of your only opportunities to ask a question of this array of experts here. Any? Yep, we have one right here. Hello. I have a question. Um, so I'm about half a century old now, and all of my life we've known about the crisis. 
We've known that we've had climate crisis all of this time. We've known it impacts the oceans and all of this. So how, you know, we're talking about different ways to get different communities and everybody, all people, to sign on and be involved in the solution. How do we do that now when we've been trying for 50 years? What do we do differently? Who'd like to jump in? Who likes to? Uh, all right. Great. You got it. I think we need to continue to play the long game. Uh, my wife and I are privileged to have four children, and they're ranging in age now from college senior to high school junior. I probably should say that with more confidence as to their ages. <laughs> I love them all. Um, <laughs> But I am been continually amazed at the subject matter that they're learning in fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade. And so the type of conversations I'm having with my children of high school are very, very similar to the questions I was having back in my pro professorial days 25 years ago, 20, 25 years ago. So I think playing the long game in the education system and then also, frankly, through fora like this, and telling people stories of local impact. It's one thing to talk about global change. It's another thing to talk about the change in your zip code and why your corn are drying up or why the rains are falling on your crops in Oklahoma uh, and so on. So I think as a strategy, um, telling local stories of impact. And then we scientists we love to study what's unknown, right? Otherwise, you just look it up, right? And where's the thrill in that? Um, you know, particularly with the World Wide Web these days. So uh, we, we need to say more, more definitively what we do know and not shy away from awkward conversations at cocktail parties. Um, my wife is a physician. I've never heard her say at a cocktail party to somebody, well, you know, sometimes smoking is good for your lungs. And, and I, I, don't mean, I don't mean to be awkward to anybody here, but I mean truly, when there is vast, vast scientific consensus, if you're asked about it in a social setting, don't shy away from it. And that's not just to we scientists, it's to those of you as well who know this, and in fact, you may have more credibility with your neighbors than do we. So I think it's a community effort at a very local scale, multiplied by millions of people who, who do get it, like the questioner. Let me follow up a bit, and, and it's actually pretty much a continuation, I think, of that question, and even of your response. And that is this. It is no surprise to anybody that we live in, in a hyper-partisan era. Not that we haven't in the past, we have, um, at various stages of our history, but we are clearly in that, that era now. Some have, have described it as tribalism. You can use whatever labels you want, you can disagree if you choose to. But my question to all of you here, and we're looking for some guidance, is how do we remove these conversations from a political realm? I can, maybe it's, a, it's another way of saying, why would this issue have, have assumed the identity of a political issue? Yeah, Jack, I would argue that the debate has changed. And, and I say that as somebody who worked, I worked in the Obama administration, then I left back to my high desert home in Oregon for four years, and then I came back. And when I came back in, in the Biden administration, one of the first calls that I got was from a Republican congressman who wanted to talk about climate. And when I had left four years earlier, when I got a call like that, I knew what the discussion was going to be. It was going to be about whose fault is it? How do we tax the oil and gas companies? Who do we blame? How do we penalize? And I walked into this discussion thinking, okay, here we go for what we would call the attribution debate. Whose fault is it? How do we attribute climate change to whom? And what he said was, um, he, he's a fifth generation farmer in a red district in a red state. I'm obviously a Democratic appointee. And he said, I can't farm the way my grandfather did. I need to have 
information products and services. I said, now we can talk. So I think the, and the answer was, oh, you obviously need a seasonal forecast that's better than what you might have had before, so you can figure out what to plant, when to plant it, how to plant it. He said, yeah, that's what we need. We had a basis for a discussion that was based on solutions. And, and whether you're talking about mitigation, reducing the carbon in the atmosphere through use of renewable energy, or you're talking about adaptation, how do you change the way you farm, it's a much better debate. I, politicians are still going to want to talk about are there penalties, are there carbon taxes, but I think we're having a lot more of the debate around how do we build solutions. And that tends to be much less partisan in nature. Other things? Mark? Yeah, I, I see the same thing. And I think the real key, and Charlotte referred to this as well with her example about of, of the fishers, uh, talking to people about what they know, what they can see, what their family has experienced, uh, what their neighbor experienced, and in this realm of climate and oceans, uh, because that doesn't require reliance on a source that you don't know. Right. And, you know, that's really the key. And people have, that was the experience of the member of uh, Congress. It's been my experience with people uh, when I was down in Florida. Uh, and uh, and they were watching their themselves not be able to get flood insurance. Uh, and, and I think that's a really, really important piece. I want to just reiterate, yeah, it's a lot about thinking about what the needs are and trying to come to those solutions. When I was doing my PhD at UC San Diego, I was working with the Center for Western Weather and Water Extremes, and we had a partnership with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to aim to produce forecasts at least two days ahead of time on when there would be atmospheric river storms. And we were able to gain funding through the, the state of California for that work because it ended up being that the forecast would allow the state to save so much water that it ends up saving the money to fund the research in the first place. So having the forecast to see Two days ahead of time, do we need to? Re does the Army Corps and um, dam managers do they need to release water or keep it? Will that storm be hitting that region or not? That ends up saving the resources that are valuable throughout California for the rest of the year. So, thinking about the needs and where there are the solutions and how advanced action, advanced action on those needs can help support a longer term sustainability factor. Charlotte, from your, your different, little bit of a different perspective here in, in terms of what you do. So your views on this whole notion of how do, we, how do we take a political label off of this? Well, I actually think the previous panelist hit the nail on the head largely because so many times I feel like now the, the challenge is around the terminology. It's not around the impacts or the solutions. It's around the words we use. And I will say that for many years, I was at an organization where I needed to be able to fund scientific research that involved the impacts of climate change on the research. And we actually, as part of our grant making several years ago, we put the climate question on our grant application. So all of the applications that came in for our review not only had to propose the research and deliverables and budget and your traditional grant application, but there's the climate question, which we had under other considerations, which is, have you considered how the climate might impact your research project? And if so, how? So it went for, if you're planting seagrass in an area, is that the right seagrass, to, is, is that seagrass still gonna thrive there in a, in a restoration environment in 20 years? Or are we gonna spend all this money to put the wrong, the seagrass that works now, but is gonna die in, in 20 years because it's gonna be too warm? But we weren't allowed, we, we did not have the approval to use the word climate change in our applications. So we put the climate question in, we just didn't call it climate, we said, have you considered the impact of the changing ocean? No problem. Went right through. 
right? Not a problem through the reviewers, not a problem with the, and, and the grant, and the scientists knew exactly what we were talking about. And so did the individuals on the coast because they're dealing with it now. So I think when you're, when you're talking about the impacts, and as Rick said, the, the, the solutions, you don't get as much pushback when you're actually trying to help a community, right? They're seeing the impacts. They're looking for support. Whether that's coming from a red administration or a blue administration, it's still support to the community. And I think that's where a lot of this is coming, the, the coming together happens. An important concept that the words matter, the way you phrase something. I think we have another question. Yeah, I have a question, again, about application to communities. Uh, you mentioned that the fishers were having to steam far up the coast, and this is a policy meets practicality, meets the historical whatever problem. Uh, how are we doing in solving that uh, policy and politically? <laughs> All right. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> I should think before I use examples, because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer to Dr. Spinrad to, to have the final word on this. The most, not surprising, the most challenging thing is when you are working with people, as this Rick said, about their livelihoods. And the challenge of shifting marine species is a, a, a very large one. I will say that both the... Ocean Climate Action Plan, as well as many other um, organizations and, and documents have outlined the need to both understand how species are moving, understand how those species' food sources are moving, and understanding how the habitats are changing along the way. Um, that, of course, then uh, doubles down to, well, what communities is that impacting? So the fishermen who are used to catching summer flounder, the summer flounder are moving up the coast, I do, we are still, I think, a little bit more in a political process of understanding what systems need to be changed in order to mitigate that. Now, I will say there has been great progress on the East Coast between the, the councils, the, the management agencies that manage those species. For the first time, though, the boundaries between them aren't set, or they're having to work across boundaries. So. In New England, we're actually in the Mid-Atlantic now, they're, they're a group of states in New England are managed by New England managers. Mid-Atlantic states, Mid-Atlantic managers, southeastern states through Florida, South Atlantic managers. In the past, there were lines at state borders often saying, okay, we're managing this area, you're managing that area, and never the twain shall meet. Now they're talking, and all three of them are talking. So there is a coordinating committee between Florida managers all the way up to managers in Maine about this particular issue. But I will say it's a work in progress. Yeah, very well stated. I think the way Charlotte characterized it is that um, there are mechanisms that have been put in place that are doing well. I mean, Senators Magnuson and Stevens years ago created the iconic legislation that serves to frame that kind of council approach. And, and I'll get the numbers wrong, but we've got great success in terms of restoring some of our fisheries from being overfished, some, not all. And, and there's a, a number of factors that are changing that. Uh, one of which, I will tell you, is that we are now, I would say, finally giving due attention to tribal treaty rights, for example, especially in the Pacific Northwest, where we might not have done that before. But it's a hard problem to solve, especially when you've got eroding stocks of fish. The other thing is that we can set up these councils and these policies and these programs and these regulatory regimes, and then you face a, a situation like this. I was in Nome, Alaska last August, and I went to the big fish processing plant in Nome. And they are set up, literally, they have equipment for processing salmon, halibut, and crab. There's this equipment for salmon, this equipment for halibut, this equipment for crab. And on the pier, they had 300 pounds of Pacific cod. And they're going to have a lot more Pacific cod in the future. So now an agency like the National Marine Fisheries Service has to establish regime, regimes for regulatory sustainable management for a very different sort of distribution of species. So there's a number of changes, and policy is hard and takes time and has a lot of constituencies in it, but I feel like at least we're starting to make progress in combining the best science with the best policy, but it needs a lot more work. Another question over here? Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Ed Potasnik. I'm squeaking. Uh, I'm with the uh, New Jersey League. Uh, 
So my name is Ed Patazic. I'm executive director with New Jersey League of Conservation Voters. First of all, I just want to say thank you for being here, for coming to New Jersey, where homeowners can expect to see in the 30-year lifespan of their mortgage a 100-year storm. We're seeing more intense and frequent flooding. Um, folks inland and on the coastal regions, whether it's sunny day flooding when they're driving down the streets, um, we're impacted and we're feeling it all over. And we're also a densely populated state where we see a lot of air pollution, asthma, cancer rates that are much higher than the national average average um, and we're very concentrated and focused on combating climate change and we believe and strongly uh, support responsibly developed offshore wind as being a part of a solution to help us stave off the worst of the climate crisis to help save our oceans from the warming that was described from more uh, climate pollution and so I'm just curious these you know all ocean experts are we on the right track are we on the wrong track and what advice might you have us as we move forward uh, to make sure we can address this this climate crisis that we have that affects us in so many ways including today as we're talking about the ocean and Rick <laughs> So when you ask, are we on the right track, you did mention offshore wind in particular, so I'm going to answer in that, in that direction. A lot of our scientists at Woodsell Oceanographic are involved in um, various, various ways with uh, studying potential impacts of the, the towers themselves and some of the supporting infrastructure and so on. Um, uh, my personal views uh, are that um, we're definitely on the right track. Um, we are a world that depends on energy and we need to get that energy from a number of different sources. Um, people far more versed than I in uh, you know, economic tales and so on and so forth, we need to certainly transition over a certain period of time away from oil and gas um, and other fossil fuels. And so we're going to need as much offshore wind as we can get. We're going to need as much solar as we can get. We're going to need to be more efficient with the appliances and our um, uh, anything that uses um, energy um, and so on. So I think that there are a lot of very dedicated, uh, talented scientists and engineers working on uh, how to mitigate impacts. Everything has an impact. I can walk across this rug and I'm having some impact on something living on the, you know, walking on the rug there. Everything we do has impact. The question is how to mitigate it. <clears throat> and uh, I'm very encouraged at the um, degree of sophistication that we're able to bring to um, these mitigation uh, processes. And. Uh, I probably would have answered this differently 20 years ago, but there's been a lot of technological innovation that's happened over the last 20 years, and so I'm cautiously optimistic for the future um, in that context. And I think that gets us to, we're getting close to some time frames here, so I'm gonna use that question and that answer as the foundation for a last question that I'll, I'll pose to each of you. And it, it follows on, Rick, what you just said. And that is, if I were to say to you, as experts here, 20 years from now, should I, as someone who, who, who lives on the ocean, who, who hopefully understands that it's not optional to be concerned, who is, as all of us are, in some ways consumers, maybe that's a, a term that we could apply here, should I then share, Rick, your optimism? that 20 years from now, things will look different and feel different and most important, be different. And, and let me, I think we'll wrap this up with a thought from each of you. Rick, you sort of gave us your thoughts. If you want to add a little bit. Short answer is yes, I think things will be better. Uh, that doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but I do think they're going to be better. Let's just work our way around. Charlotte, you next. I can only be optimistic. I think that's the only way to be. And I, my hope is that necessity is the mother of invention. And I hope things, I hope we don't have to have something even more terrible happen in order for the tide to turn. I don't think we will. I think the tide, from what I've seen and what we've been discussing today, I think, I think there are many fewer people that don't 
ask the question of, is climate change happening? They may have an attribution of who's causing it, but there isn't so much a question of, is the climate actually changing? And I think that alone, has, ha, that sea change alone, is going to help us turn in the right direction. Tashiana? I agree. The way to be is optimistic uh, and solutions oriented. There's a lot of perceptions that have been changing that I think are for the good, thinking about climate and the oceans. And there's a lot more that can be done, but we have a lot more technologies. And you know, people on this panel have dedicated their careers to this work. And there's also a lot of us in the early career and mid-career space that are really passionate about this. And I think it'll be neat to see in the next 20 years what we can also do and contribute. Margaret? Well, I know that Rick Spinrad is going to be optimistic. So, if I'm, not alive in 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to put a cautionary note in. And the cautionary note comes from the IPCC's special report on keeping warming below 1.5 degrees. And they've said it is not possible without directly removing CO2 from the atmosphere. I, uh, like the rest, I'm very optimistic about technology uh, being an ally in this. I'm very optimistic about changing views. Uh, I'm not very optimistic about us being able to really say we're going to get that done in 20 or even 30 years. It's a monumental job. And so I think we are going to see more climate impacts. But I think we'll also have a lot more tools in our quiver to address those impacts. So it's definitely a half empty, half full thing. But that should not make us, I, I'm not dispirited about that. I'm a pragmatist, and I think that's how we all have to be about this. Rick, going to give you the last word here. Well, thank you. And, and actually, I'll um, say something very similar to Margaret. And, and I am optimistic. But I'll, I'll start it by saying that um, right now, the time between billion-dollar disasters in the United States is about three weeks, on average. Back in the 80s, it was about three months. And we can expect to see that continue over the, over the next 20 years. But the, the good news is that we're getting much better at understanding why that happens and how to uh, adapt, respond accordingly, whether it's tropical cyclones, hurricanes, or some other phenomenon. So I'm encouraged that our ability to adapt to uh, climate change will be better. I do hope we start undertaking some aggr aggressive approaches, because that 1.5 degree number is a daunting number if you read the literature. But the thing we haven't talked about here that I also would want to bring up that gives me hope is that the people that will have leadership responsibilities for ensuring we do the right thing in 20 years are those high school and college kids right now who will be up on this stage in maybe not 20 years, maybe 30. But um, I have found in working with many youth organizations around the country and around the world that people in that age group, call it the 15 to early 20s age group, are so well informed, so passionate, incredibly organized, the only thing they lack is experience. And so I think if we in our leadership roles can embrace the influence of these young people now in our organizations, and ensure that they are the ones in charge in 20 years, that's why I'm even more optimistic that we'll be in better shape. Sorry. Uh, we began this session by talking about our, our hopes that at the end we might have a better understanding of the nature and extent of the problem, the better understanding of what solutions may be possible, and certainly a better understanding of, of how we can get there. And I'm sure you'll all agree with me that our guests today have, have done two things which I think are essential for progress, and that is they have informed us and they have made us think. And on behalf of all of us, we should thank them then, and Tony also for the program.